Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, very pleased, proud, and privileged to be here this evening and share my work and my memoir with you, particularly at this time in the history of our country, before these critical elections the issues of choice and reproductive freedom burn brighter and stronger than really ever before. So I'm going to start with reading from my preface. And I start with a quote from Ludwig Wittgenstein. Nothing is so difficult as not deceiving oneself. 20 years ago, I attended a party at which a numerologist offered to analyze my name. After performing what appeared to be complicated mathematical computation, she told me my number was 11, a power number. Then she looked at me quizzically. How strange, she said. This is the first time I have ever seen this. What is it? I asked, genuinely concerned. Your numbers tell me you will make money from war. I met her gaze steadily as I replied, I do. As an only child, growing up in the 1950s Philadelphia, I occupied myself with warrior fantasies. My imagination soared with visions of knights, kings, and queens who populated the English history books I would get from the library. The dramatic tales of battles driven by focused energy and heightened danger excited me. It wasn't conquest I was after. It was the warrior's extraordinary sense of mission. I was moved by an empathic connection with the vulnerable and oppressed. I wanted to challenge great evil power to lead troops into battle for the most noble of causes. Unfortunately, the world in which I was living allowed for few grand heroics. Rather than a battleground, it was a special kind of wasteland. I grew up at a time when one's worth and acceptance as a female were measured by the width of a crinoline skirt, when French kissing branded you a sexual outlaw, and when little girls' dreams revolved around their weddings and lessons learned from watching Queen for a Day's ritual of improving one's life with domestic conveniences. It was a vast wilderness of mothers, teachers, and friends encircling me in a traditional femininity, creating a suffocating loneliness that I could not name nor understand. I felt powerless to change my fate until Queen Elizabeth I, whose story I discovered at age 10 finally broke that silence. Her survival skills were legendary. Her mother was beheaded when she was three. Her stepmother executed when she was nine. She was sexually molested at 15, and she spent two months imprisoned in the tower, a hair's breadth away from execution herself. She learned to carefully scan the political and emotional landscapes for signs of potential danger. She ruled 16th century England by herself, refusing to marry or to bear children. The androgynous strategies of this woman who wanted to be both king and queen of England were unheard of for a monarch of her time. I kept the lessons I learned from Elizabeth close to my heart and my head when I broke free from Philadelphia and came of age in New York City in the 1960s. The time was ripe to pick up her gauntlet and challenge women's traditional roles. I became a child of one of the greatest social revolutions in history at a time when it became politically possible for women to legally gain and exercise reproductive choice, the power of life and death. A time when the right to choose became the fundamental premise of the movement for women's liberation, and when that expression of that truth was every woman's entitlement. In 1971, two years before Roe v. Wade, I opened one of the first legal abortion clinics in the country and thrust myself into a world that came with battles to fight, replete with invasions, death threats, and killings, opportunities for courage and heroism, and the necessity for bold leadership, strategic thinking, philosophical debate, and entrepreneurial skill. There were barbarians at the gate 
self-identified as right-to-lifers. I call them anti-choicers or antis throughout this book, waving pictures of bloody fetuses and sometimes hiding bombs or guns under their coat. My sword was a six-foot coat hanger held high, high over my head as I declared my sisters would never return to back alley butchery. I raised a bullhorn to rally fellow soldiers decrying the clinic violence that swept the nation. This was my historic stage. It was a war, and I felt I was living my destiny. I helped midwife an era in which women came closer to sexual autonomy and freedom than ever before in history. The very idea that women could rise up and act in their own best interest electrified men and women alike during those years and the foundational works of second wave feminists inspired millions of my peers. But my feminism didn't come from books or theoretical discussions. It came in the shape of individual women presenting themselves for services each day. I began to understand the core principle of feminism as I held the hands of thousands of women during their most powerful and vulnerable moments their abortions. I wasn't immune to the physicality of abortion, the blood, tissue, and observable body parts. My political and moral judgments on the nature of abortion evolved throughout the years, but I quickly came to realize that those who deliver abortion services have not only the power to give women control over their bodies and lives, but also the power and the responsibility of taking life in order to do that. Indeed, acknowledgement of that truth is the foundation for all the political and personal work necessary to maintain women's reproductive freedom. My story is the story of women's struggle for freedom and equality in the 20th century but it is also a personal story of obstacles, survival, and triumphs. Like Elizabeth, I did not want to give birth to my successor. I never dreamed of being a mother, nursing a child, shaping a young life. I wanted, I needed to give birth to myself. And the, in the arms of the women's movement, my delivery was aggressive, even violent at times crushing and battering me as I reached for the freedom to become. Most painful of all were my terrifying glimpses of the all-encompassing sense of being alone. Whatever one can say glowingly about the women's liberation movement and our collective problems requiring collective solutions, this fact cannot be denied. Becoming is nothing if not a solo journey. Thomas Merton taught that there were three vocations, one to the active life, one to the contemplative, and a third to a mixture of both. This book is the story of my mixed life. I am an activist, a philosopher, a transgressor of boundaries. I strive to live in truth, or perhaps truths. I have not escaped this war unscathed. Like all women who have gone into battle, I am scarred. But perhaps that is the definition of wisdom. Perhaps our wounds, the crevices and cracks in our innocence of perception that come as the price of experience are our marks of understanding. So I've led and continue to lead, to lead a, an extraordinarily singular, singular life. And my journey started um, in a very different place. And I got here almost serendipitously. Uh, I studied to be a concert pianist. Uh, I had musicians in my family, and uh, my entire adolescence was spent practicing three, four, five hours a day, or reading philosophy or history books. Um, I never intended to go to college because it was irrelevant to me. You know, great artists did not need that. So I graduated music and art, and I took myself off to study and starve, of course, because it was necessary for my romantic self-image, which I did in Paris and, and worked and practiced. And then I realized that music was basically too hermetic for me. You know, I wanted to engage more in the world, but I didn't know what I wanted or could do. So I, uh, I came back to New York, 
and actually uh, realized that uh, I should 